everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to have the opportunity of sharing my research with you today through this video, even though I wasn't able to attend the conference in person. Uh, thank you for being here and listening to my talk. Uh, in this talk, I will ask what information is carried in events level neural representations. We experience the world as a continuous uh, and rich stream of information, but our memories seem to be differently structured. If I ask myself what I did last Monday, I may remember some specific events from that day, but not the entire moment by moment dynamics. For example, I remember I did yoga in the morning, I committed to work later, and I spent time with my family in the evening. So it seems that experiences are chunked into events in my memory. And in fact, this notion is supported by a large body of previous work that show experiences are segmented into events, and these events are important for memory organization. To better understand how the brain supports cognition in real life settings, event level representations might be a key. Uh, by event level representation, I mean neural representations that capture the entire event as a whole, rather than moment by moment perceptual dynamics. And uh, this approach may help us to overcome some of the idiosyncrasies of naturalistic paradigms. For example, two events of having meal during the day may have high level similarities in spite of differences in the details. So in this talk, I focus on the question of what information is carried in events level neural representations. And how do I study these representations? Imagine this is the time course of neural activity in a voxel in the brain that which is responding to continuous um, rich stimuli like a movie or a narrative or during remembering some of the past autobiographical memories. We time stamp the beginning and end of events uh, on this time course to know where each event is located. Then we obtain one data point from each of the events in this time course. Imagine this uh, pink event. We, as I said, we get one data point from this. And this could be by averaging the time course of within the event, as Janice Chen uh, did in her pioneering work in 2017. Or it could be that we capture this event level activity using GLM methods that are good at separating events from nearby episodes, like a list of square single GLM um, by Janet Mumford. So if we do any of these two methods, we obtain a data point for this voxel from this pink event, um, which would be something like that. And if we repeat this procedure across all the voxels in an ROI or in the entire brain, what we get is uh, a events level spatial patterns that then we can use to compare with other events, um, you know, or using different types of analysis. So in this talk, I will describe three studies that have used this method to study the nature of events level neural representations. And I won't go over all the details of these uh, studies and experiments. I will just highlight the points that are, uh, I think are most relevant to this question. So the first study, in the first study, I show that these uh, neural representations, they carry modality independence and high level information that can be tracked during reinstatement and imagination of those episodes. Then I will show that they have information, that they have some fine grained information like about interpretation, subtle changes in interpretation of, event, of events, and they can be updated to incorporate new information. And then I will show, you, show that uh, they also carry information about the emotional state uh, of participants. So let's start with the first part uh, of the first question. So to study this question of reinstatement, we have people watch a movie in the scanner, and then one of them recalls the movie in their own world in the scanner. And this a paradigm is a replication of previous work by Janice Chen, who looked at the reinstatements um, using these uh, events level representations. And here we said to replicate her work. As I described earlier, the method we use is to look at the similarity between corresponding events 
between the encoding and the, in, and the recall. So if the similarity between the corresponding events are higher than non-corresponding events, meaning the average of diagonal in this matrix is significantly higher than off-diagonal, that means there are event-specific neural representations that are shared between the speaker and the viewers. So this is exactly what we see. We see in a large set of areas in the default mode network, uh, there is a, a high uh, reliable similarity between uh, the neural representations during encoding and during the recall. And this uh, replicated previous work. And then we play this recording to another group of people who have never watched the movie. And this is the part that is very interesting and exciting for us, that these people, they have to imagine uh, the events in the movie through limited and compressed story that they heard from the speaker. Are there similarity between the people who actually saw the movie and the people who imagined that through this limited source of, source of information? So in other words, do neural representations elicited by purely constructive imagination of events resemble the perceptual experience of the original events? And to our surprise, we witnessed a, a reliable similarity in the entire network, which suggests that perception and imagination of the same events, they uh, elicit shared neural representations in DMN. In other, and in other words, we could say that the communication of these events through the circle has been successful. And then also this shows that DMN regions, they contain high level and modality independent uh, event specific representations. So to conclude, through this communication circle, I showed that the default mode network carries modality independent and event specific neural representations that are shared between perception, brain statements, and imagination of the same events. And also perceptual experiences versus imagination of the same events, they share neural representations in DNA. So we established that these uh, event level representations, they carry high level information, but now we want to get deeper into what exactly do they you know, represent. So uh, specifically here, we ask that if the, these representations are sensitive to subtle differences in interpretation, while everything else you know, in the event is the same. And also if they can be updated to reflect the changes in this interpretation. So to do this, uh, we use a movie that has a, a big twist at the end. I'm sorry if I'm spoiling the Sixth Sense movie for you here, if you haven't watched it. So this movie is about a child psychologist who is treating a kid who sees ghosts. So at the end of the movie, you realize that the psychologist himself is one of the ghosts and that, in fact, throughout the movie, but you only realize that at the end. And then uh, we had people watch this movie in the, in the scanner and then watch the twist in the scanner and then uh, had them do a cute recall in which we presented cues from each scene and asked them to talk about what happened in the rest of the scene. So we asked them to recall all of the scenes in the movie, but some of these scenes were critical for us, meaning that their interpretation was dependent on that twist. The other scenes they were you know, the twist, knowing or not knowing the twist, wouldn't uh, change the interpretation, which I call the non-critical scenes. So this is our main experimental group. We had these people who watched the movie thinking the doctor is the doctor. You see that as a blue box here. And then after the twist, they do their recall. Now with hopefully this update in their interpretation, thinking that the doctor is now a ghost and then reflecting back on their memories to you know figure out that how this person was actually a ghost and then we have another group that they watch a movie and do their recall but we spoil the movie at the beginning for them um, so they watch the movie and do their recall knowing that the doctor is actually a ghost and then uh, we have another group that watch the movie thinking the doctor is a doctor we don't show them the twist in the scanner. They do their recall, again, thinking that the doctor is a doctor. So uh, when, sorry, the doctor is alive and is treating the child. So when they, this group, they came out of the scanner, I showed them the actual ending of the movie. And 
witnessed live what the effect that I was hoping that happens in the scanner. So they were really surprised. Uh, one person was running around the room uh, saying that why I didn't realize um, sooner and then having some conversations about also oh, in that scene, it seemed like that, but it was in fact, you know, this. Uh, so, so here we hope that we capture this uh, uh, phenomena in the main experimental group in the twist group. So to get to the question of our, uh, our event representation sensitive to subtle changes in interpretation, we focus on the encoding here. So for the encoding, if our uh, uh, if the interpretation has a, a significant effect uh, on these representations, we expect the twist group and the no twist group to be more similar to each other because they both think that the doctor is in fact a doctor. And the similarity here is again measured using the RSA method that I showed before. And then, uh, but between the twist group and the sport group, the similarity should be should be lower because they, these two groups, they have a different interpretation. And this is what we see in a big subset of regions in the default mode network. Uh, so it seems that uh, the, the subset of default mode uh, DMN regions, they exhibit differentiable neural representations uh, across the two interpretations of the movie. And also note that it, this is not all the DMN regions. For instance, important regions like MPFC are missing in this map. And we also uh, focused this analysis only on DMN regions because we had established before that uh, this is the region that carries these high level neural representations. So the next part of this uh, study would be now to go to look at the recall and ask uh, if this update of, uh, inform update of representations actually happens, now the recall of this group should be more similar to the spoiled group instead of the no twist group. So we first showed that this update happens in the recall behavior, and then we use the same method to look at the neural representations the similarity between the neural representations across these groups. And what we see is that a sort of a subset of regions in the DMN, including bilateral MPFC, they exhibit evidence for this updating process. And it seems like that the representations in these uh, regions is now more similar to the uh, spoiled group, so that this updating has actually happened in these representations. So uh, here I want to show a data point about the role of event contents. So I mentioned before that we had some critical scenes that they were relevant to the uh, twist and some non-critical scene. So here I have uh, defined an index that combines uh, the changes in inter uh, the uh, uh, results that we got from the encoding and recall before. Basically, this, these are the regions that are sensitive to changes in interpretation during the encoding or recall. Uh, if our hypothesis here is true, so this should be only true for critical scenes. So non-critical scenes should not show these, you know, effects that I just, you know, described. And this is exactly what we see. So uh, this further confirms that um, what we are capturing here is actually the subtle uh, the effect of subtle changes in interpretation on these events level neural, rep uh, neural, uh, interpret neural representations. So to conclude, I showed that neural representations uh, of events in the DMN reflect subtle differences in the interpretation uh, they are updated to incorporate new critical uh, knowledge. And also, uh, this updating only happens for the events uh, that they actually, there is a change in the interpretation. This is specific to, you know, those uh, representations. So this takes us to the last part in which I ask if these uh, neural representations carry information about the emotional state. Uh, 
For this, we have a module, an, an emotional regulation task using a real life autobiographical memories. So we have people uh, uh, record uh, some memories from the past six months, uh, and then like with the title for each of the memories, uh, and then on the day of the scan, we present uh, each of those memories uh, twice as a cue, and once we ask them to immerse themselves in that memory uh, uh, or to distance themselves from that memory. And then we ran an analysis that I described earlier to obtain estimates of neural response for each of these events. So each cue item, uh, each cue event, and each immerse and each distance uh, e uh, event across the whole brain. And then we use the PINES model, which is a uh, uh, abbreviation of picture-induced negative effect um, model uh, to obtain the estimates of emotional state during uh, each event. And this is a, a model that has been trained on a large set of negative effect data, and we can use that to estimate emotional state on each of, each of these events in our experiments. So let's first look at the Q period. Uh, for this period, we have the Pines expression on the y-axis, and then each of the uh, the same the cues of the same uh, memories once prior to the immersed condition, once once prior to the distance condition on the y-axis, and we see that there is no significant difference between um, these two uh, the representations of these same memories uh, in the Q period. So now, if we look at the task. Um, events or task periods, what we see is different. We see that uh, there is a significantly higher Pines expression in the immersed condition, which suggests that uh, in this emotional regulation task, emotional state can be predicted from these events level neural representations across the entire brain. So to sum up, um, I, to answer in, to this question that I presented earlier, I showed that event level neural representations are a window to the content of past episodes. I showed that I showed that they can be tracked across individuals. They capture modality independent information during reinstatement and imagination, and they capture fine grained semantic content of events. Uh, and they also track changes in the emotional state. So I hope this talk was uh, interesting and informative. Please contact me with questions. If you have any, I want to thank you and also thank you my advisors and colleagues at both Princeton and Columbia. Uh, the data sets for the first and second study are uh, on the open neuro that can be used uh, by researchers who are interested in these kind of questions. Thank you so much for listening and have a great rest of the day in the conference.